Um, and I've been just completely in awe of the resilience of our people who have been fighting tirelessly, especially through this year in the face of extreme adversity. Um, Reclaim celebrated its fourth birthday this year and has built such a wonderful amount of people power in that time. Um, thanks to all the hope and the love and, and, the, and the care that each of you pours into this and into each other. Um, so I appreciate you all so much. I'm glad you're here. Reading about all of your joy in the, in the chat has given me a lot of joy to start off with today. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand things off to Rachie Weisberg, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about our important electoral work this year. Cool. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Rachie. Um, can you hear me okay? Cool. Great. Um, I usually hear pronouns. I'm a Reclaim member, and I was the field director for Rick Krajewski's campaign and then West slash Southwest Philly votes uh, this past year. And, you know, um, <laughs> it's funny reflecting on 2020. Uh, so many ways 2020, you know, has been just the worst year ever for a lot of reasons I don't need to name here. Uh, but for me, 2020 has also been this really revolutionary year. Um, to think I started this year really scared of power, um, and I am ending this year hungry for it and feeling like I deserve it and I want more of it. And I owe a lot of that, uh, maybe all of it, to Rick Krajewski and the entire Rick for West Philly team, uh, many of you who are here today. Um, you know, I've been organizing for a few years now, but until this year, I struggled to internalize that I had my own stake in this fight. Um, I felt like as a white person from an upper class background, I shouldn't want any form of power. I didn't deserve any form of power. Instead, my role was to be a martyr. And then I think about uh, my very first one-on-one -on -one meeting with Rick. <laughs> I was pretty nervous. Um, we were sitting in that corner table of Manikish, um, which I wish we could be at today. Uh, and Rick asked me about my vision for, for West and Southwest Philadelphia. And I don't remember what I said, but it was some cliche or whatever. And without hesitation, Rick pushed back. And he asked me to be specific, to really lean into what I wanted to see, how I wanted to feel. And I started to think about my own struggle with chronic pain and the healthcare system in this country. Um, I was on seven different health insurances in 2019. And beyond barely figuring out the extremely bureaucratic application process, um, throughout that whole time, I wasn't sure I could afford the premiums on the ACA. I thought about how I didn't want anyone else to suffer through that. Um, no one should have to suffer because they can't afford uh, affordable health care. And then a few months uh, slash lifetimes later and on Zoom, <laughs> I admitted to Rick after one of our like Sunday night meetings that I was again struggling with, with my self-interest and my role in this movement. And you know, despite being exhausted, I think it was October of 2020, so you can imagine we were pretty tired. Um, he stayed on with me for an hour. He asked me to imagine what it would look like not to live in fear, what it would be like to be able to plan for the future without worrying about if the world will even exist, much less if I can afford to be healthy in it. You know, um, <laughs> I never thought someone could make me cry on Zoom, uh, but then again, I never thought a lot of things before this crazy year. And now that caring, patient, dedicated, very well-dressed leader uh, is in the PA State House. Rick won, he ousted, yeah, so it's like, Pretty awesome. <laughs> congrats, Rick. Um, congrats all of our leaders who are here today. Um, Rick ousted Jim Roebuck, a 35-year incumbent. Um, and not only that, he won almost 50% of the vote in a four-way race. And Rick won because of the power that we all built in the form of organized people, over 200 volunteers involved in the campaign, and organized money, raising a whopping, you can't, oh, you can hear my drum roll, I'm not on mute right now, <laughs> $180,000, uh, the most on record of any candidate in the 188th district. And Rick is not alone uh, by any means. He is one of the four Reclaim endorsed House reps or state senators we have on this call today. And now all of us, whether or not we are technically represented in the district or not, have someone uh, in the legislature who is in this, who's grounded in this fight for liberation. A rep who believes that healthcare is a human right, the incarceral system is unjust. A rep that is willing, as Rep Rab did, to stand on the House floor and demand justice for our Black and POC neighbors. They're willing, as Rep Fiedler did, to unabashedly demand an end to toxic schools. They're willing, as Nikhil Saval did, to declare that we need a Green New Deal for Pennsylvania and come out with a bold vision of what that would entail. So yeah, 2020 uh, <laughs> maybe didn't go as many of us had hoped or planned, but despite that, and despite everything being thrown at us this year, we won a lot and we're just getting started. And I'm so 
honored and happy to introduce um, our four leaders who are here with us today. And they're each gonna have two minutes and then I will abruptly cut them off. So I hope they can get through everything in just those two minutes. And Rick Kurdiski, you are up first. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Rachie, for that intro. Um, I can remember that, that original conversation at Manakish so, so vividly, uh, and I can't wait to have lunch there again. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so proud to be on this call. I feel so honored. Um, I also want to give props to Rachie, because uh, I think she is, she is being a little modest. Uh, we built power together. Right? I was the, the person on the ballot, but Rachie was the field director that organized over a thousand volunteer shifts, made, that did 2,000 phone call contacts, 17,000 door knocks, uh, thousands of literature drops in the middle of a pandemic. Right? The biggest, one of the biggest programs West Southwest votes um, in the entire city. And um, that is the power of building people power, right? Of us building relationships in solidarity. And that's the kind of vision that I wanna bring into Harrisburg. Um, a vision where I'm not just the rep, but I'm the rep that's part of a movement that is holding each other accountable, that has a vision of elected officials and campaigns and issue work that goes above and beyond what we expect because it is so important. Uh, housing is a human right. Healthcare is a human right, economic security and dignity are human rights, and they are currently under attack from all angles, right, on all levels of government. So I am thrilled to be able to, to be um, one voice in, in Harrisburg, along with Rev. Rab, with Nikhil, Elizabeth Fiedler, um, because we have so much work to do, but I know that we can win because of leaders like Rachie, because of the leaders that are on this call. So I'm pretty sure I'm, I might be at time. I'm not sure where my time's at. No, I thought I, I can keep going. Okay, wow. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really excited to create an office that is gonna be reactive, responsive, that is gonna leverage the kind of power we've built over the last year and a half. Um, I'm hoping to have an office starting uh, pretty soon, actually. Uh, we're gonna be in the same office as, as Rep Roebuck, right on 47th in Baltimore. Um, it's going to be in the heart of the 188th district and i'm excited again to to create this vision um, that i have built alongside leaders in reclaim um, the vision of ending mass incarceration of having fully funded public schools of of having housing policies like uh, rent control um, fighting back against developers and 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 pushing back against gentrification and making a world where we can all thrive thank you so much Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah, that pass for Rick. Um, and thanks, yeah, I know I'm a little, I can't help but be modest, what can I say? But it's pretty incredible what we did together. Um, and that was only in the primary, we did even more stuff um, for the general election. So next, I would like to ask Elizabeth Fiedler of the 184th District to uh, speak. Liz, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you, Rachie. Um, I am State Rep Elizabeth Fiedler, really excited to have just been reelected to my second term in the State House. I serve South Philly, the 184th, and it's been quite a year, right? Um, I said to my six year old the other day, you know, I was turning the page on the calendar and said, wow, we're almost through 2020, thank goodness. And my six year old turned to me and said, what's wrong with 2020? Um, and then we talked it through and like, oh, okay, yes, yes. Um, I think the passage of time can be confusing when you're six. You don't remember something that happened three months ago was in 2020. Um, I've been reflecting a lot on the moments that we endured and survived um, in 2020. And it's pretty heavy stuff, right? It's painful. Uh, it's really heavy. It's hard to sit with. Um, and we're all here together on this call to support each other in the challenges that we face going forward, in the obstacles that are on our path to seeking the better world that we want for our families and our neighbors, uh, both for the people that we know and for the many people who we have not yet met. And I wanna, take, I wanna make sure to take time to celebrate and embrace the amazing victories, the moments that the people on this call 
made happen, including uh, Senator Nikhil Saval and Representative Rick Kurjewski, also reelecting uh, Rep. Rab and myself. Uh, to everybody who worked so incredibly hard on one, two, three, or four of those races, uh, because I know that there are a lot of people who were working uh, extra, extra time. Thank you. I am so excited to work with this amazing team on a Green New Deal, Medicare for All, Housing for All, Union and Workers' Rights, Ending Toxic Schools, and one thing that you're going to hear a lot about from me because I've become moderately um, fixated on it is a progressive tax system, making sure that we have a tax system that benefits poor and working people and not rich people and corporations is the key to accomplishing so much of the great stuff that we want to have in Pennsylvania and that we deserve to have in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And finally, I just want to remember the amazing massive dance party that unfolded outside of the convention center, because I know so many people on this call were there or were calling up other friends to ask them to show up. Um, we were calling for a really basic thing, right? Count every vote, defend our electoral system. And it was just beautiful to see. It was amazing energy. It was awesome. I am a terrible dancer, and yet I still had fun. Um, and it was just a great crowd. It was, you know, we were there for the right reasons, but also doing it just in the most peaceful and beautiful way possible. So I just want to thank everybody who has been part of the highlights of 2020, who's been there to support me and support other people on this call during the challenging moments of 2020. And Moving forward, uh, we're headed to Harrisburg. There will be tension, there will be beauty, and I'm really excited to be with you all in this fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. It's so awesome. I'm so happy that you got reelected. Um, all right, and now we have Representative Rab um, from the 200th District. Um, are you with us? Oh, I'm here. Oh, hell yeah. Hey, folks. So you have two minutes. All right. I, you know, I'm, I'm here to express my, my gratitude for uh, Reclaim uh, sending me reinforcements. Uh, you know, not all Democrats are created equal, not all uh, public servants um, are politicians, not all politicians are public servants. You all have sent me uh, hardcore reinforcements in 2018 and 2020. So I want to thank all of you for all of your work. It makes it easier for me to do, to, to do my work, but my work is our work. It's the people's work. And um, just having a D behind your name is not nearly enough. I want hardcore progressives. And we're not the left. We're the, we are the forefront. We are the avant-garde. Folks are catching up to us. We're on the right side of history. We're doing it. And this is a movement, and it's important because you're talking to elected officials who have to run consistently. We in nonstop two-year, you know, intervals is really small um, and very short. But we have to look at the larger arc um, of justice here. And 165 years ago, my great 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 grandfather was a part of a multiracial group of badass radicals who helped a 13-year-old girl disguised as a boy go flee slavery from Maryland through Philadelphia to Brooklyn and on to Canada. It was 165 years ago this past Monday and I was on a Zoom call with fellow descendants of badasses who made that possible. People who didn't actually know each other. Our ancestors didn't even necessarily know each other, but we are part of something bigger than ourselves, bigger than our neighborhoods, uh, bigger than our own geographic communities to do something in furtherance of justice. And that's what we have to do. And it's not gonna happen in an election cycle. It's not gonna happen through one candidate or one campaign or one political party. And that's what I'm thankful for. And I'm appreciative of all the work you all continue to do. And I'm here for it. Oh yeah, I love the idea that we are the avant-garde. <laughs> The John Coltrane of organizing. It's a great <laughs> image. Um, all right, thank you, Representative Rab. And finally, we have Nikhil Saval, who is representing us from the state for the first war, I mean, the first district, sorry, uh, for the state Senate. You have two minutes, Nikhil. I feel like I'm like on a debate stage or something. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Rachie. Um, thank you, um, Reclaim. Good afternoon. Uh, every time I'm granted the honor and privilege of speaking at a Reclaim citywide meeting, I get filled with nostalgia. Um, as some people on this call may know, I was a co-founder of the organization and many of the early meetings were held in my cramped living room with its really terrible chairs. 
Um, and every event, you know, we have these citywide, we mark the growth of the organization. We have 100 dues paying members, 250 dues paying members, 350 dues paying members. And at a certain point, I kept using that same number, even though it was becoming woefully out of date. And I was just, just I just asked now, I'm like, where are we? And we have 800 dues paying members of this organization, which is just extraordinary in the course of four years um, to have grown that much. And the extraordinary thing, and Representative Fiedler mentioned this just now, is to have felt that presence in Philadelphia in November following the general, general election in which we were all insisting that we should count every vote. There was that palpable pulsing warmth of a crowd filled with members of Reclaim Philadelphia. So it just was a really extraordinary moment. Um, but though we have achieved, achieved incredible power, I mean, represented by these incredible elected officials, my, my colleagues, on this call, we, we do not have enough. Going into this pandemic, which virtually by every measure is worse than the first stage, we do not have enough power to do the things that we need to do. Today on Twitter, Representative Fiedler asked what legislation each of us would want to pass out of Harrisburg. Just what would be your top piece? And the list of ideas was just extraordinary. Reforming the state constitution, as she just mentioned, to make progressive taxation possible. Establishing parole for lifers and ending death by incarceration. Fully and luxuriously funding our schools. These are great ideas. In fact, these are just the beginning of what we want to achieve. And we do not yet have enough power to get them passed in our legislature. And in the midst of a brutal pandemic, this makes me deeply mournful. But in the words of Joe Hill, the immigrant union organizer from the 20th century, who said going to his execution, we don't mourn, we organize. We don't have enough, let's get enough. We are hundreds in this call, thousands in this state, millions in this country. We came this year as millions. We will return again and again every year as millions. I want to say to you, nothing will turn us back. Let's return again as millions. Wow, thank you. Thank you, yeah, everyone. Um, just, this is really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Nikhil says it really well. Like, we, we have so much power and we're, we're just, but we're not, we don't have all the power and we have to keep building power. But I think even just on this call, 298 people, like that is, that's people power. I mean, that is like truly incredible. Um, and just in closing off this section, I just wanted to say this quote from the acclaimed writer, Octavia Butler. Um, she writes in Parable of the Sour. All that you touch, you change, and all that you change, changes you. And today, we are not simply here to replace the old democratic machine in this city and beyond, but instead we are radically transforming what politics in this city can and will look like. We are building a world rooted in care and compassion, and just the belief that a better world is possible. And I am so, I just, words can, it's like, feels ridiculous, but words can't even describe how grateful I am to be in this fight with all of you, and uh, just, hyped for what we're going to do next. No one, we're, I just, we have, it's happening. Okay, I'm done. I'm passing it on. Um, back to Chelsea, right? Yes, thank you. I echo that sentiment. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Richie, for your thoughtful insights. Thank you for all the time and care that you put into building power for the 188th. And thank you to Rick, um, Elizabeth, Chris, and Nikhil, um, who I all trust very much to build power for the working class. Um, next up, I have the real pleasure of introducing one of the most lovely people you will probably ever meet, um, Michaela Lovegood, who is going to um, give us a closer look at what it takes to make structural change and what that means for our work going forward together. Thanks, Chelsea, yep. so much. And no knock on you, it's always difficult. So just so people know, my name is Michaela. And if you forget, please call me Mick. I absolutely don't like being called Michaela, so just everybody knows that. But anyway, um, it's really great to be with you all here. Um, my One of my favorite memories of being in Philadelphia so far was this citywide meeting in January, which I think was one of the last times I got to be with a lot of people before the election time and we were in COVID. So it's really great to be with you all here. My name is Mick Lovegood, she, her pronouns. Um, over on Chestnut Street, not far from uh, my representative, Rick uh, Krajewski. 
Um, and I am the deputy executive director for PA Stands Up, which is the statewide entity of which Reclaim, you all are a part. Um, so it's really great to be um, in the local home and having this conversation with you all today. And I wanna shout out also to Nikhil and to Liz and to Rep, uh, Rep Rab and just say hi and thank you for all of the amazing work and the leadership that you are. I'm so excited to be thinking about building and replicating your progressive spirit, your, your courage, your power, um, and, and really being the inside force that we need to bring change in PA. So I just wanna give a shout out to all of you and thank you. Um, and I wanna say a thank you, Rep Rab, for bringing up the arc of justice because the arc of justice is long, but we can't continue to rely upon that phrase to get us clear about how we need to be moving along that arc. And um, a lot of the work that we do do in our campaigns, a lot of the tools that we use, strategy, power analysis, direct action, um, mass meetings, all of the tools that we use to organize are really foundational for social change. There's no, as you know, no major social change that's happened in the world that didn't involve people taking to the streets, that didn't involve protests, that didn't involve everyday people vying for up against the powerful and making change. Um, and we have used these tools largely inside of the context of winning specific campaigns and inside of the context of building organization. And this has been really good for us as a movement. But what we're finding is that our goals in order to really move along that arc of justice require us to go beyond that. We have to start thinking about transforming society. We have to start not only thinking about winning elections and winning campaigns, but we have to start thinking about what does a transformed Philadelphia look like? What does a transformed Pennsylvania look like? And what are the strategic steps we're going to make and by when to get there? These are the kinds of conversations we have to start having because at the moment we find ourselves um, really being inside of fights that get us wins do, those wins don't always stay. Those wins are never ever really enough, right? And they don't always reach the people that we need them to reach. They're important wins. But we have to start thinking broadly and, and more far and farther. So the point of this conversation, and I'm gonna try and move you all through it um, as uh, efficiently as possible, is to begin to start charting out what that could look like. Um, give me a second to organize my computer and to share my screen. Okay, so, so this is our vision for a transformed PA, our, our long-term agenda. And where we start that conversation is we start our conversation with thinking about two things, really understanding the difference between incremental reforms and structural reforms. So let me start off by asking, or just sort of laying out, talking about what incremental reform actually is. Incremental reforms are small reforms that win slight improvements in the lives of our communities, but they maintain the current organization of wealth and power, which is concentrated, as we know, in the hands of corporations, big banks, and the 1%. Um, looking in the chat, can somebody give an example of an incremental campaign? Ooh, they come so fast, whoa. Yes, fight for 15, ACA. Yes, these are all incremental fights, police reform. Oops, sorry, my thing is clicking, but I can't click. There we go, sorry. Yeah, so another uh, couple examples. Great, I'm seeing, oops, sorry. I'm having technical difficulty, my apologies. Okay. There we go. All right, so not, so let's stop on the examples. I'm gonna keep moving forward. Um, so this example of the, or the definition of structure of an incremental reforms. Definition of structural reforms are reforms that transfer wealth and decision-making power 
away from profit-making entities like corporations, big banks, and the 1%, and towards people's institutions, while making government institutions more responsive and democratic. Structural reforms are less about the policies themselves than they are about the process of shifting power. I really need to say that again. Structural reforms are less about the policies themselves, but about the process of shifting power. Someone give us an example of a structural reform that has happened. Civil Rights, yes, Civil Rights Act, Civil Rights Voting Act, yes. Financialization, yes. The, yes, in the N NLRA. Does somebody want to go off mute and actually say what the NLRA is? Because that's really important to just talk about in, in terms of structural reform. It's a right that gives um, employees in the private sector the right to form and join unions and to engage in collective workplace action without retaliation. That's right. That was in 1935. It was deeply significant that workers had the ability to collectively bargain for their, their, their wages. That was something that never happened before. That significantly transferred, that gave decision-making power to workers that they never had. So that, that is um, a, a great example of, of a um, structural reform. Just making sure I hit on my notes. Um, so let me ask you all, why is it important for us to focus on fighting for structural reforms? I gave my answer, but I want somebody to come off the chat and say why, or come off of mute and say, why do you think it's important? Because they get the job done very quickly. And it also like covers the basis of, I guess, like um, general issues that everybody suffers from um, directly. Um, well, well, what are you thinking of when you say that? Um, so like just like going through like all of the 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 like recommendations and like um, submissions from like people on here like all of these like describe like massive cultural shifts like women's suffrage like even like the example that you gave that I didn't even know existed um, these are like like really wide sweeping general um like i guess like changes that improve the lives of everyone collectively right um, thank you so. for, for for yeah but that those are they actually get us to where we want to go right it's like we we can win these fights we can like we've got a bunch of fights that people are in right now like around covid relief and we've got to win those fights because pe too many people have died in 2020 and we need to keep people from dying right now. But those getting right, you know, COVID stimulus money doesn't even get us back to like the ground zero, right? To be able to right the ship of what's happened. It's really, that's what it's trying to do is to dig us out of a hole. It doesn't get us to the promised land that many of us dream of in terms of what we want our communities to look like. That's what structural reform does. But I'm looking in the chat and I want to also say it, we, we can live with this notion that structural reform is like the promised land, the, the myth of the final destination where that's all that happens and that's all that is. And I say that in so far as sometimes we can think that once we win a structural reform, not, that nothing can, can happen to it. And that's not true. I mean, you know, the collective bargaining uh, component got destroyed in the fights with the unions in the early 2010s, right? So it's like, just because you win that structural reform doesn't mean that you win it forever. But it does give you that because power moves like that, power shifts, power changes. So, um, but it is important to recognize that why we fight for structural reform and why it's important is that it gets us to the change we want and gets us on that nose. It's also important for us as we think about structural reform, it forces us to think about ourselves as having real power, right? You know, if you think about like, what if Reclaim and its allies across the state collectively had control of the governor's office? You know, and really think about what we wanna do if we had that control. If we have control over the legislature, 
right? We have to start imagining what is the power we need to have in order to win those fights and not just the end point. And structural reform puts us in that position as we start to become strategic about how we shift power, how we bring resources over from that side to ours. And also structural reform ultimately keeps our eyes on the prize. Again, the long game that we wanna win. Again, when we're talking about that arc of justice, that arc goes somewhere. And beginning to really start to articulate what that looks like is what structural reform and fighting for that look, um, allows us to do. So the next question is, why is it important for us to also focus on incremental reform? Somebody come off mute and share. Yeah, I think it's actually easier to get things done if you uh, commit to smaller tax to, to uh, smaller actions or smaller goals. So they build upon each other. So you look for what's most practical. Not everybody thinks the way we do, and there's resistance to those ideas. At least if you find some some kind of commonality with the other side or show them how it benefits them, they'll be more open to more progressive ideas. Oh, that's right because they show people that change, right? That change can happen. That's absolutely right. Like it keeps us grounded in fighting for change. It keeps us grounded to fighting inside of our own lived experiences and the lived experiences of our community versus, you know, one day when we get over here, or let's just keep our eyes on the long game and not really think about the problems in front of us. We couldn't get down to the vision that we wanna see around housing if we don't deal with the stimulus package, we don't deal with getting these resources. So we have to do both. And then I think you also said, and thank you for, for um, sharing that, you know, we build power through these fights. We bring people with us along the way. Just like this election cycle, there was a lot of folks, um, just, you know, we all know that was not in any way interested in having to get behind Biden, right? But we had to really get clear that we had to win that fight so that we could actually win other fights. So, and we brought people along the way by moving the, that work, whatever we felt like about it. So, so there is power and there is necessity in keeping our minds focused and our strategy developed inside of both of these fights. And, okay, my, too many Zoom things taking up my window, sorry. Um, so, like, so there's pitfalls to this, right? Like if we put too much focus on our incremental uh, reform, then we find ourselves being all about victory, but not really having much vision. I see that in the last probably seven years as more and more grassroots organizations have gotten into political fights, this is what's happened. Right, it's just one election cycle, then the next election cycle, then the next election cycle. And they're all important. The races that people are moving and organizing and mobilizing around are super significant. The power that is being navigated is important. But if we don't have a vision or arc for where that power is moving and what we're building toward, there's a lot, a lot of funny things that show up in the meantime. We lose candidates that you know are ours, they get pulled to the dark side. We, we lose sight of our vision, we lose base. So it's really important to recognize that too much on that side um, is a pitfall. But then again, too much focus on structural reform means that we're all vision and no victory. And then we actually then lose power. Um, and you, you know those groups. I mean, you know, we're not gonna say anything, but we know the groups. We've been to those meetings where they sit around, they got a lot, really great ideology, really great analysis, but it's like, okay, when are we gonna go like, go get that person, right? Or when are we gonna like really move on this? Um, and, and so it's really important that we recognize that our work moving forward is about walking the balance, the, the, walking this tightrope and living in this tension, that we are fighting for increasing shifts in wealth and power. And that means that we have to have a long-term vision and we have to move incremental fights to move us toward that long-term vision. Pause, I see a lot of quotes happening. Great, okay, so good talk is happening. Thanks. Cool. All right, so, um, so this is what this looks like. On our, on our X axis, we've got the change, moving in the direction of making change. And on the Y axis, we're moving in the direction of building more power, increasing shifts in wealth, increasing shifts in power. I'm gonna share with you all an example of pathway to structural reform that is um, that really comes from what 
I believe is you all sister organization, uh, the People's Lobby, uh, the PAC is Reclaim Chicago. Um, and not too long ago, um, they got involved in and won a uh, minimum, that got uh, one $13 minimum wage for Cook County, which is the largest county in Illinois. So, um, so basically doing this kind of like pathway to structural reform, you have to start where you are. And where uh, the People's Lobby was, was winning this campaign. $13 minimum wage in Cook County. Awesome, 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 great stuff. This was a huge victory. 200,000 low wage workers could potentially see a raise because of this win. But it really obviously isn't enough. Um, it's understanding that, um, that there's still a lot of forces that are attacking workers in Cook County. There's still a lot of dynamics. And we also know that $13 was not gonna be enough for, for folks. Um, so there was a lot of research that the group did. Um, and out of that research, they developed the idea for the global minimum wage. This would be a system that would calculate the cost of living in countries all around the world. It would require countries to set their minimum wages according to their calculations. It would also hold corporations accountable to meeting those wage standards. This meant that workers in the US, Mexico, or Bangladesh are all making living wage. Now, this is what we would call a structural reform. It not only makes things better for workers around the world, it also ends the global race to the bottom where workers are forced to compete with each other across borders for who will work for the lowest wages. This is a major weapon that multinational corporations currently use against workers in all countries. The global minimum wage ends the race to the bottom by putting a floor under all workers that we can lift in a uniform way. And this will remove this major weapon that multinational corporations use against us. But see, the problem with the global minimum wage is that it's currently not possible. We have a plan to ultimately win this. I mean, well, a plan to ultimately win this at the World Trade Organization, a global organization that currently governs the global economy. But we are not currently in a position to walk into the WTO and demand a global minimum wage. That wouldn't work. So the next step is to actually to go along the way of power that you currently have, the power to win the $13 minimum wage campaign. And then move up to what's next. One that would make sense would be, and this would be a stepping stone fight, would be winning a $15 minimum wage nationwide. The fight in Cook County was part of the national fight for 15 effort. Being part of an effort to win a higher minimum wage nationwide would be part of how to build the power necessary to win wage standards across borders. Now, moving to the next part of this arc, a step beyond that would be to win wage standards in NAFTA. Now, for those of you who don't know, NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Agreement, which currently governs trade and investment in Canada, the US, and Mexico. Trump has launched the, pro the process of renegotiating NAFTA, and we have to cut an issue around these renegotiations. The renegotiated NAFTA must include the wage standards we want and the global minimum wage applied to the three NAFTA countries. So our next steps could be to win a renegotiated NAFTA that includes binding wage standards. So it's understandable, right? Like you can see the increase in power that would be needed in order to make that change. But the way that this process works is that you start with the current fights. Where are you now? And then you wanna plot out what is the long-term agenda? What is the structural reform we need to fight for and win? And then you bring yourself back to the milestone reform. That long-term reform is hard to look. I mean, global minimum wage in and of itself, the mind boggles to think about it. We want it, we desire it, we need it. But how we get there, we still don't know. So having a milestone reform like amending NAFTA, or renegotiating NAFTA is a milestone reform that we could really move ourselves to take on and know we're on the right step toward the structural reform we wanna to get to. And then of course we have what are called stepping stone reforms or fights that we are that are moving in that direction. So this is the idea of the arc of justice and really thinking about what is the thing we are wanting to win? What does that look like? What does it include? And then how do we go about getting to that? 
And if you notice, we have this picture of a mountain to denote this for a couple of reasons. It's recognizing that the arc towards structural reform in any of our issues is never going to be linear. It's never going to be like, then we go this, and then we go that, and, and then, yay, we won. It's actually going to sometimes be stepping forward, stepping to the side, because you got a like, big you know, crater you got to move around. Sometimes it's going to be stepping back. Like, you know, we won ACA back in 2011, but all, most of 2017, I think there was five major attacks on ACA. We had to defend it. It wasn't like moving it to the next level. It was ensuring that it survived. Sometimes our stepping stone fights is just defending what we've already won. And that's real. The other reason why we use um, a mountain is to recognize that mountainous terrain is treacherous and rugged terrain. And we know that there is treachery in all of the different systems, our political, our economic systems, our institutions, there is treachery. There is so much that is fighting to keep us from being able to pull and win any of these things. We have to stop pretending like that that's not true or letting that just sort of sit over on the side, but we've gotta be more strategic and recognize that this is treacherous. What is our strategy? What, is our, what are our strategies to deal with those treacheries? And are those stepping stone fights that make it possible to continue to move on our arc? So in our current fights, we have to ask ourselves in the current moment, this moment right now, as an organization, ask what are the fights you're currently taking on? When we think about the fights, I know that there's major, there's several different mass liberation campaign issues that you're taking on, taking on housing. Um, and those are some of the key areas. And I know there's work moving around climate. So really looking at what the cuts are, what, what are you trying to win right now that's significant? What does it mean to our community? And really laying that out is, would be the first step. The second, believe it or not, is actually what are the structural reforms that would fundamentally transfer wealth and power on our side, on our issue? What is the structural reform inside of mass liberation that will ultimately and fundamentally transfer wealth and power back to the people around punishment, around blame, around uh, crime, around security, around safety. Those are the kind of questions that we would move toward. And then we would look at the milestone reform. What's the next big mountain that we should aim for? What is another reform we could win along the way to our long-term agenda? That's the kind of dynamics, you know, so for me, my own personal experience around mass liberation is I believe in prison abolition, but I also have a very deep self interest in um, abolishing the death penalty. I have a brother who's on death row. I want to abolish the death penalty and I can't imagine a world where we can, if we can't stop the state from killing people, we can't stop the state from um, housing people and calling that okay. So like for me, abolishing the death penalty is a stepping stone reform that we have to make happen in order to abolish prisons, in my opinion. But this is the kind of thinking that we have to do in order to think about this arc. Then of course, it's like, what are the fights we could take on that would move us toward our milestone reform? Just to give you an example before um, I stop for any questions, um, looking at the healthcare fight, you see that the first rock that's in, in the first position is where we have been for a long time, and in some instances still, private healthcare is where, right there, um, at the, the, the this, when this graph was made, this was the current fight in the current circumstance. And then we look at the reform or the rock that's at the far end of this um, arc and you see healthcare as a public good. Another way of saying healthcare as a human right is understanding that ultimately it is a public good that everybody must have and that's what we wanna to move toward. Uh, reform um, or a milestone reform, what we are moving toward right now, improved Medicare for all. And an important and milestone reform from private health care was the Affordable Care Act. But again, like I said, things don't move in this straight, beautiful line. You've got other fights that have to be attended to. In order to get from the Affordable Care Act and to improve Medicare at all, we have to look at limiting pharma profiteering. Pharmaceutical costs are off the roof. It is what's causing most people to um, you know, deal with food insecurity, to be homeless, and you have to make choices on, about your healthcare versus other areas of your life. Uncover, coverage for undocumented people. 
any out that this system has for any group of people is an out that it can get for anybody. So it's important that we start thinking about who is being excluded from being covered and look at those stepping stone fights. So then we also had, as I said before, defending ACA and some wins where we've seen, like in the state of Maine, where they've won state level single payer. So these are sometimes a stepping stone may feel like a step back, sometimes it's a step forward. But it's never a line. These are rocks, so it's rugged. And it's really about moving us from where we are right now to where we say we wanna be. Um, I have the doc copy of this particular document for uh, you all, if um, should be dropped in the chat for you to um, use and take a look at. Um, PA Stands Up is embarking in 2021 to move toward a long-term agenda process um, for Pennsylvania, we're going to begin to start talking with more and more folks, our uh, elected allies, ally, other ally organizations. We're talking about, you know, potentially having relationships even with service organizations because our service organizations need to be politicized just as much as our grassroots organizations. Um, but really having a, a, a key stakeholders who are in alignment around a progressive PA thinking about what our long-term agenda will be, or our structural reform that we wanna to move toward in anywhere from five to six issues. So you will definitely be hearing more about that. This is the first step, is just educating on this process and what this looks like, and begin to start thinking about that. What you're gonna be moving on in 2021 is moving us somewhere along a larger line. Once we have this LTA process, that's gonna guide us in terms of 2022, because it's gonna say, what do we need to do in 2022 to meet this reform arc that we said we want to be on? So this is the opportunity. And the real change, and I'll say this before asking any other questions, the real change that this comes down to is right now we are constantly in the position of saying, okay, how much power do we have and what can we win with it? Right? It's like, right, what do we have in the refrigerator? How do we stretch it so everybody can eat? And what we need to be saying is, what do we want to be eating that's healthy for us? What do we want to be eating that nurtures us, that lets us grow, that lets us, you know, be our best selves as a species? And what do we need to do to get that? What do we want to win? And what is the power we need in order to get that? Completely different question, completely different circumstance. Thank you, Jenny. I, I really just came up with it on the spot. I'm very impressed with myself, actually. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm going to pause there and find out if there's anyone who wants to cough off, come off mute, ask a question. I think I have a minute. How, do I have much more time? I think I have a few minutes to take questions. Is it okay if I jump in? Yes, please. Uh, so I came on here like with very specific questions because of uh, the current situation I'm in. Um, and there's a couple of things that I wanted to cover, um, but the first two that, and the only two I'm going to ask because I don't want to take up time, have specifically to do with one, how do we uh, get our city to diversify like its economy into uh, industries that would be like one beneficial to a lot of people in the population that have like particular skills. Um, and two, into like very sustainable industries that could like really not only be profitable and healthy for our community, but like they're important for the future. Like I feel like we don't focus on like community greening, which is just like a completely logical thing to do. And we could make our city very beautiful um, and uh, I guess like endearing for the populace that lives here, which is important for mental health. We could do things like uh, you know, expand the creative industry, which would do I'm just going to ask if you would land your question because you, you said oh. you didn't want to take up too much time and I believe you. So we just land your question. No, no, um, just land your question. How, do, how do we uh, create like a, a, a landmark goal to get uh, our city to expand like industry um, towards like, I guess, like um, people who, who, who aren't able to find work? Um, and right. I mean, I feel like in this conversation, there is a structural reform that that is deeper than that, right? That that that's a part of, and figuring out what that is would be useful. But at the end of the day, coming back, it also comes back to 
what we're talking about. We've got to build power. We've got to organize people. We've got to organize money. We've got to, you know, create a, a strategic arc to make that happen. We have to elect um, elected who who will champion, you know, that 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 point of view, and will will move their 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 elected colleagues to do the same. You know, it's sort of you know the the world of organizing. I think what the real question is is, are you willing to grapple with how much power it's going to take? to have that kind of control over the city. Oh, and that and, was actually going to be- Wait, hold on, let me finish. Are, and, and this is to everybody. Are you willing really to grapple with how much power you will have to build, right? As a part of even this organization, because it just can't be centered on even Reclaim in Philly, right? There's so many other different aspects. So, and, and then, um, yeah. And then are, are, are we going to be willing to really think that long-term and short-term at the same time, do both instead of making the choices that we're always being asked to make that is wrong. If we just do this little thing right now, then we get that done and we can go back to the real thing that we want to win. Right. We hear that all the time and, and that that's never works. Mitch, if I may, oh. Mick, Mick. Mick, Mick, I'm sorry. I, I love your pragmatism. I think it's, I, I think it's refreshing. Um, but my question is, if you think or if the group thinks, this is my first time here, um, that we could work within an oppressive structure. Um, my example would be um, like photo ID. If rather than trying to get people to vote or get legislators into power to, let's say, get um, the idea of photo ID off, out of the law, if we instead made it a moot point by organizing and collectively raising capital to get those people that are disenfranchised photo ID so that that's one less obstacle from uh, you know voting or even from just just to protect their civil rights so well uh, I, I think I think this is a beautiful question Robin thank you for right. asking it and I think you know my, my first answer is is that I hope you stick and do more with reclaim and and do the training because I think this will help I think the question that you're asking feels to me like it sits very largely in the world of service like if we could raise the money and do the thing right then we wouldn't have to worry about this as a thing and while that theoretically is the way to go about doing it the the challenge is is that the system that creates that that dynamic still stays in place but even if it, you know because like i used to work for a, a feeding organization we had a a, a a dinner every night for anyone who wanted dinner we um, had community development and we organized around the root causes of hunger and there are a lot of people who wanted to work in the kitchen, who wanted to give more food to make sure, but the kitchen was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. More people were hungry. Feeding more people did not do anything about the fundamental problem of why people were hungry. Oh, but I, I, my idea was like expanding the electorate mm -hmm. to then change the, the, the structure itself. Right. Right. So, yes, Sorry, my bad. I thought you were like, why don't we just go out and raise money and get everybody IDs? I'm like, what? Sorry, my bad. I no, no, that. just expand it. They see what I mean, you could, them. but that's, yeah. Appreciate it and then move, they themselves become activists as well. Yeah, well, that's what we, yes, that's, that's definitely what we should be doing. Sorry, I misunderstood. I think I'm out of time, but I want to make sure that you all have my email. Um, and if you have any other questions, please reach out to me. And we are going to be do, uh, reaching out to all of you through Reclaim to talk more about what the long-term agenda process will look like and how you can get involved. We'll be really looking to get involved with like your task force and having members of who you're already organized to play a role on the statewide to actually move through what we just showed you. That's actually work, right? To figure out what is the structural reform? What are those fights? And then to present that to the larger body that we say is us as Pennsylvania, to decide that this is the direction we want to collectively move in. So I look forward to being in that process with you all. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Meg. Your presentation was super powerful and informative. Um, thank you for providing that, that grounding for us and helping set the tone for our work in 2021. Um, I know that I struggle personally in my organizing with striking that balance as you said between fighting for incremental reforms and structural reforms so um and i know other folks on the call really valued your insights on that as well um so thank you again and with with these ideas of, of change and shifting power in mind um, i'd like to pivot a little bit and 
um, introduce um, some of our Reclaim Caucus and task force leaders and invite them to talk with us about all of the, the power building that they're each doing. Um, so first up, we will have uh, Katya, who is going to talk with us about the awesome work the Mass Liberation Task Force has been doing. Um, it's been such an important year for this work. So thank you, Katia, for sharing with us today. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Katia Perez, pronouns she, her, and I'm the Mass Liberation Organizer here at Reclaim. Uh, so I came to Reclaim, I joined Reclaim with a mission, and that was to focus my organizing efforts on dismantling the carceral state and to bring the voices of the directly impacted to the forefront. Decarceration, judge accountability, and defunding the Philadelphia Police Department are all campaigns that hit home for me. My commitment to mass liberation was born out of lived experiences where time and again, it was proven to me that the criminal justice system served only to oppress the marginalized. Sophomore year of high school, I had a classmate who was friends with everyone. One day, news broke out that he had been arrested for fighting and stabbing another student outside of school. A couple of weeks later, our English teacher broke the news to us that our classmate had been sentenced to 15 years in prison. I still remember my English teacher muttering under his breath, he's just a child. This classmate was not in any gang. He had never been in trouble with the law before. He was the class clown who got into a fight that went too far. It was then that I realized that people who came from the communities that I came from weren't given second chances. No child should be sentenced as an adult. Years later, my own brother was standing in court during his sentencing hearing and I witnessed a judge who went against the recommendation of the district attorney and prioritized his political ambitions and need to come across as tough on crime. Tough on crime on someone with no criminal record who was both going to school full time and working 40 hours a week. Again, I saw how people who come from communities like mine aren't given second chances when mistakes are made. My brother was sent to prison and the cost of phone calls, commissary, and care packages was difficult for my family during a time when both my mother and I were not securely employed. And knowing that third party sellers were making money off of inmates, most of whom came from homes that were struggling financially, enraged me. And the police, the police do not prevent crime. I've had my apartment broken into and Philadelphia police told me there was nothing they could do about the stolen items. I wasn't surprised. When I found myself in a situation where I needed to file an emergency protection from abuse order, Philadelphia police told me there was nothing they could do unless I had been beaten within the last 24 hours. Okay, so no protection prior, got it. It was a struggle for me to go to the police in the first place because I did not want to see someone I cared about subjected to the racist criminal justice system, but there are no other options for survivors. The Philadelphia Police Department does not protect and serve our communities. However, when I practiced my right to peacefully assemble inside the Municipal Service Building this past summer, that's when Philadelphia Police brought in the counterterrorism unit to arrest me, along with 26 other protesters present that day. On my drive home that evening, I witnessed how the PPD stood by as protesters assembled near the Christopher Columbus statue were harassed and physically threatened by white supremacists in South Philly. I got beef with the PPD. 2020 has been a monumental year for black lives and as a direct result for mass liberation as well. The uprisings in late spring catapulted the demand to defund the police nationwide. Here in Philadelphia, we faced a particular barrier to, defund P to the defund PPD campaign due to state legislation. Act 111 is a state law which prohibits police officers from striking if, collecting, if a collective bargaining agreement cannot be reached between the city and the police. In exchange for this prohibition, arbitration is offered. 
Arbitrators serve as middlemen during negotiations between the city and the police, but they side with the police over 70% of the time. For the past 50 years, the Fraternal Order of Police has used this state legislation to continuously increase police budget, no matter what type of economy we're in, and to chip away at police accountability. Who these arbitrators are and where they come from also lacks transparency. Act 111 makes it very difficult to fire police officers because they can bring their grievance to arbitrators who, again, often side with the police. The Community Control Now campaign targets Act 111 both locally and statewide. Locally, we're demanding greater transparency in the contract negotiation process. Step one was making sure the city held its first ever public hearing on the police contract. The message was clear. The majority of Philadelphians support more transparency and tougher disciplinary actions against police brutality. On the state level, we're working with coalitions and state legislators on amendments and bills that can loosen the stronghold Act 111 gives cops over our communities. To build stronger support to defund the PPD, our Shift the Narrative campaign is building community narrative power to lift up community-based solutions that go beyond policing. The challenge now, they, to challenge how newspapers cover violence, police, and mass incarceration, and to center our community's needs in the story of what public safety really means. Shift the Narrative Project is a collaboration between movement and community leaders, including Movement Alliance Project, Free Press, MIC Center, Amistad Law Project, Reclaim Philadelphia, Power, and Youth Art and Self-Empowerment Project. Our Mass Liberation Task Force is made up of dedicated Reclaim members who see the bigger picture and are committed to building a community free from state oppression where everyone has the opportunity to thrive, no matter their race or background. We need to make sure this momentum continues past 2020. We need more members to help us sustain uh, for the fight uh, for the long haul. We know the incredible structural change movements and people power can make happen. Join us. If you'd like to know more updates on all of our mass liberation campaigns, come to our next mass liberation meeting on Wednesday, December 16th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And check out the link in the chat where you can register to get the Zoom link. And if you want to officially join the task force, we'll drop the mass lib sign up on the mass lib sign up form in the chat as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Katya. Um, it's been such a pivotal year for mass liberation, and we appreciate hearing about what you and the task force has been working on. Um, and I want to thank you also for sharing pieces of your story um, and for your honesty and vulnerability. Um, I'm going to hand it off next to Sterling, who is going to talk to us about the um, Reclaims Housing Task Force, which is doing really vital work in ensuring that housing is a human right. Okay, I'm um, just going to make this uh, pretty, pretty sure to tell you a little bit about myself and then um, the two local issues that are going on. Uh, my name is Sterling Johnson. Uh, I've been a part of Reclaim for some time. I can't even remember. Uh, but I'm also working with uh, another group called Philadelphia Housing Action, where we have been uh, really engaged with uh, housing takeovers during the during the uh, the protests. Uh, for myself, I, I'm I come from a harm reduction background, uh, um, a a person that ha has been in recovery, a person that experienced addiction, a person that I'm a person with a lived experience of, of having a just having unstable housing, uh, being disabled. Um, I'm from around Philadelphia. My family's from Philadelphia, but um, I just experience these things on a on a on a daily basis. At least when it comes to my world, my uh, it's not one event. It's just the daily uh, uh, event of being a person with mental condition, uh, receiving dis discrimination and oppression on a daily basis that never ends. So um, when we talk about uh, these these, uh, all these issues, it's about uh, having the ability to live in a space, to be in a space, um, and to feel free. And that means anywhere in the city um, in itself. So 
and that is what many of many of the people that we are with do not experience. So uh, to go to the work that we've done, um, it was around um, like doing housing takeovers and having an encampment protest that ended up uh, having a sub pretty substantial win. We um, went into houses, had people squat them, mothers and children squat them, uh, part of, uh, and then also did a very public encampment protest. Uh, and the people that were that were there were, were Reclaim. Uh, Rick and Nikhil also supported uh, our work early on and we survived through many um, really threats from the city to take us apart. Um, and there's nothing, nothing can, that can be said, but we needed all the institutional support that was uh, from the people that are here. And what happened at the end of that, you know, was now we have about um, many jobs through building trades, um, at least 70 to 80 houses that will be transferred into community land trust that were, that were poised to be taken into the private market. And uh, when we talk about structural change, uh, what we are looking to do here is to really focus on the programs that are like pretty supported by the federal government. This program happens to be rad, which is to take public housing and to take it and put it into the private market. And that was our focus here. And we were able to stop that. So, and I know um, we'll be talking about this in the housing task force work um, meetings. We want to end these, these, this privatization of public housing. Uh, that is NDRAD, N Rental Assistance Demonstration Project, which is a, which is a project across the, across the country, but that has been especially hurtful in Philadelphia, where there are a lot of, a lot of large houses that are being given to private developers. And then, secondly, uh, we overall have a focus towards making sure homeless people. People that are in house that are especially in this winter are given support. Um, right now, there is federal money uh, that is going to be that is available to the city of Philadelphia, which they are not getting. Uh, they are choosing to not spend it. Um, they are going to close two of the hotels on December 15th and going to give people either the option to probably go to an apartment that is, uh, from what we're seeing in Northeast Philly, um, or to be on the street and those aren't choices the uh, if your people's services are in center city and you're giving telling them that they can live near Feasterville that's not a choice so we're going to be I'll be able to tell people that on Tuesday uh, just a little of what you know you could help with that but in general there are many different there housing is one of the most complex issues <laughs> from the construction impact tax that is uh, being presented now that would hopefully put money into the affordable housing trust fund uh, but, but in general, uh, I think maybe the home guarantee has been already been presented as a, as a place where there's a lot of um, a lot of work at the federal level too. So um, yeah, please come to it. And uh, you know, I just did want to mention that uh, Jennifer Benich is, is occupied PHA. That's the person that has led a lot of the work, and we just kind of been following behind and writing her coattails. Honestly, when it comes to a lot of these actions, that have been very direct and very effective. So uh, that is that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sterling. Um, I appreciate your you and your leadership, um, and thank you for sharing with us about what the housing task force has been up to, um, and how we can work together to ensure, as I said earlier, that housing is a human right. Um, next up, um, I'd like to invite Estelle to talk with us. Estelle is going to um, share with us what the Reclaim Gender Justice Caucus has been up to this year. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Um, all right, um, my name is Estelle, pronouns are she, her. I'm a leader with Reclaim's Gender Justice Caucus. And we are a caucus who welcomes everyone because we know that every single human is affected by gender norms and the oppression of patriarchy. Um, this summer I learned from Bettina Love about freedom dreaming. And that's what we've been up to in gender justice, freedom dreaming. We want to learn, we want a world where transgender and gender nonconforming kids feel safe in school. We want a world where sex workers have true labor rights. We want a free world free from policing and prisons. In short, we want a world where everyone's body is respected and protected. 
In our caucus, we invite people of all gender identities to examine how we can dismantle all systems of oppression. Personally, this caucus has reignited in me something that my step grandpa taught me a long time ago. And though we may all be different, my liberation is tied up in your liberation. As Fannie Lou Hamer said, we're not free until everyone is free. When I'm thinking about my stake in this fight, I often think about all the people in my life. My mom, who was never taught about consent. My sister, who was exploited at an early age for her beauty. And my grandmother, who had 11 pregnancies and not a single one was a choice. And the thing about me is that I'm man-sized. I'm almost six feet tall and I have broad shoulders. I grow muscle easily and at 43, can't believe I'm saying this, I'm capable of growing a beard. Uh, for most of my life, I've tried to make myself smaller and more feminine. And throughout my teens and 20s, I was asked if I was a boy or a girl. Once even uh, a group of young men tried to beat me up because they thought I was an effeminate guy. It wasn't until they realized that I was a girl, they backed off. Gender norms are everywhere. Some of you have seen my kid in these Zoom meetings. So far, he identifies as a boy, and he also has the most beautiful, long, wavy hair. And I hear him getting misgendered on the playground all the time, and he handles it a lot better than I did. But why can't boys have long hair and enjoy unicorns like he does? And why can't girls be big and love sports? And why do we have to be one or the other? And what about those of us who are still trying to figure out where we all fit in? Now I want to break all these stupid boxes and I don't plan on recycling them. Uh, on November 15th, uh, Gender Justice held a patriarchy teach-in uh, for the Reclaim members. We described how intersectionality is imperative for our collective liberation. Paul Fitzgerald, Sherry Cohen shared parts of their stories to illustrate why, in Paul's words, no one can be an anti-patriarchy ally. We are all in it, affected by it. Natalie Robin and Lee Webster put together a patriarchy timeline available on Reclaim's website. Please help us build this document. We're focusing on U.S. events from 1619 to the present that exemplify how patriarchy works with white supremacy and capitalism to form a web of oppressions, which we must work together to untangle and ultimately smash. In the coming months, we are going to present a more refined version of the teach-in for the general public. Right now, we're looking for more participants. We want your voice to add to this discussion. And in the coming year, we're looking forward to collaborating with other BIPOC-led feminist organizations in the Philly area working on internal education and supporting efforts to dismantle the prison industrial complex and the sexism it perpetuates. If this sort of rabble rousing interests you, please come to our general meeting on Sunday, December 13th uh, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. And I wanna also thank uh, Maria Thompson and Caroline Borshield and Lee Webster for helping me make this a lot better than it was when it all started. The end. Super exciting work. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Estelle. Um, and again, thank you for your vulnerability and your honesty. Um, so chugging along here, thank you again to everybody who's spoken so far and for sharing all of your wonderful work with us. Um, next, we are going to learn some more about the White Anti-Racism Caucus, and I'd like to invite Lena to speak with us about that. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lena. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm, the, I'm a Reclaim Steering Committee member and a co-founder of the White Anti-Racism Caucus. I want us all to spend a moment getting into our bodies. I invite you all to close your eyes. Notice your body. Notice your body in the chair that it is sitting in. And take a deep breath. And 
Notice anything that is coming up for you. You can open your eyes. Throughout the course of the election, I saw a lot of my childhood friends post on social media their intent to vote within their values. There were young white women who, like me, were raised in the Midwest in the Christian right. And the value they most held closely was their religion and their pro-life views. So they were voting for Donald Trump. Meanwhile, here in Philly, this picture from the 2017 Women's March on DC hangs on my wall. And I look at it every day as a reminder that while I organize to center the leadership of black women, there is work to be done on myself. Work to uncover and heal the trauma of white body supremacy. Resma Menekem, a trauma specialist, stated, until white liberals begin to actually develop a culture of anti-racism, somatically abolishing white body supremacy, until they begin to think about anti-racism as a culture and less about anti-racism as a strategy, they will continue to re-wound people of color. I often wonder how I got here today, being on the opposite end of the political spectrum as my pro-life, pro-Trump childhood peers. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death this year brought up a core trauma that reminded me why I'm here, a trauma rooted in white body supremacy. My primary form of sex education in the Christian right was abstinence only education. My body was my husband's, nobody else's, a hypothetical white man, not even mine. It was called purity culture, and I went along with this for many years. I was lied to. I was lied to about my body, about pleasure, about my choices, and my power to control my body. It cost me my health and safety. Because despite all their good intentions, I became sexually active in my early 20s. I remember my mom even sending an email to try and give me dating advice and putting in all caps, do not have sex with him. And my boyfriend at the time, he wanted to use the pullout method. And because I didn't have the words to, to, to convince him otherwise, even though I knew we should be using condoms, I went along with it. I'm really grateful for my friends that convinced me to get on the pill because I'm certain that I would have gotten pregnant. But that didn't stop me from getting an STD. I'm so grateful for the friends and doctors who treated me with compassion and understanding during that time. As an organizing tool of white supremacy, Christianity and purity culture literally denied me the ability to be in my body, to feel the most natural human feelings. This is the intent of white supremacy. It is able to thrive because we are so disconnected from ourselves, from our bodies, from one another, from the earth, from our communities. It is dehumanizing and destructive. And white supremacy by disconnecting us from self, humanity and any sense of culture gives us a free pass to avoid examining whiteness and our participation in systems of oppression. What starts at the individual expands out to the systemic. This disconnection doesn't just reduce our ability to live fully as white people, but devastates whole groups of people. And that's why Reclaim founded the White Anti-Racism Caucus. White people are harming people of color at the individual level and through our systems and structures. We must work to address white body supremacy and heal our cultural trauma if we are committed to ending racism. Trauma is the story that our bodies tell themselves about what is safe and what is a threat. Our core cultural traumas have taught us that black bodies are a threat. This trauma has trained our bodies to react in harmful ways to the presence of black bodies. The White Anti-Racism Caucus is doing the work to heal our cultural traumas, unlearn harmful bodily reactions, abolish white body supremacy, and to build a radical white anti-racist identity. 
So I wanna leave you with two more quotes from Reza Menachem from his book, My Grandmother's Hands. And in it, he wrote, ideally, America will grow up and out of our white body supremacy. Americans will begin healing their long held trauma around race and whiteness will begin to evolve from race to culture and then to community. The other possibility is that white body supremacy will continue to be reinforced as the dominant structured form of energy in American culture. In much the same way, Aryan supremacy dominated German culture in the early 1930s and 1940s. The second is this. There is a way out of this mess. It requires each of us to begin with our own body. You and your body are important parts of the solution. Your body, all of our bodies are where changing the status quo must begin. That's, thank you. Thank you, Elena, for sharing the work of the um, White Anti-Racism Caucus with us. And thank you for so beautifully illustrating how white supremacy is, is harmful and traumatic for every single body. Um, and how we each must find that personal stake in destroying white supremacy. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to the POC Caucus, um, which I'm a member of. It's for black and brown members of Reclaim. Um, please consider joining um, if you identify as such. Um, I think Sergio will be able to drop a link in the chat for you to sign up for that caucus if you're interested. I hope um, hearing all of, uh, all of these stories of all of this powerful work has excited you um, and inspired you to challenge yourself, um, to engage deeply with the community around you, um, and to join us. So I'd like to invite our last speaker of the afternoon, Steph, um, to share a little bit about Reclaim membership and what it means to join us. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Chelsea. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you all hear me well? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm here to, you know, like proposition you all to join Reclaim, um, you know, as a first step in fighting for our collective liberation. Um, you know, my name is Steph. I use he and pronouns. And I'm a radical black queer organizer from Southwest Philly, and I'm a member of our steering committee. I was born to ailing parents whose lives have been shortened by the predatory, predatory healthcare system. My mother died a few years ago due to liver failure after years of struggling with addiction. During my childhood, my mother was recovering from a lifetime of substance abuse and would try to supplement her desires for harder substances by working nonstop. When I was about eight or nine, uh, she had been clean for about five years and was working on a nursing degree. She had always drank, but never in large quantities. I would remember her days off, uh, spent with a can of Old English, some Luther Vandross, and something in the oven. She's from the South, so if she couldn't grow it or pick it, she wouldn't eat it. So I spent a lot of time shucking corn and stemming string beans. Things changed around my 10th birthday uh, when my mother lost her job and had to leave nursing school. I watched as she spiraled into a deep depression and the bottles began to pile up. She would spend more time in her room and sometimes wouldn't come out at all. Soon after, we were forced to move in with a guy my mom was dating, um, and that's when things changed. The house was condemned, and there was no running water. We used, to gener uh, we used a generator for electricity. After about two or three months, my mother decided it was best for me to live with my dad, so I moved in with him. And shortly after that, I found that my mother was in prison for defending herself against her abuser. Uh, she spent some time in prison when she returned, things were drastically different. Her health began to decline significantly, and she began using harder drugs and drinking more. After years of substance abuse and hardship, my mother went into a coma, and doctors said she would never wake up, so I had to make the decision to keep her on life support or take her off of it. I could not afford to keep her alive. Stories like my mother's are why we need a medical system that isn't tied to where you work or how much you make. We need universal health care for all because our ills are not isolated or separated. They're intersectional. We should be, we should be able to choose, um, you know, uh, to live sustainably. We shouldn't have to choose between health care and a living wage. Why are we forced to forfeit what little we have for more, for a few more years of struggle? 
Uh, why do so many working poor and working class people have to choose mediocre candidates to keep white supremacy and autocracy at bay? You know, Trump lost the election, but the fact that some of his authoritarian aspirations were realized as a reminder that we have work to do. We can't afford to stand by, we can't afford to be comfortable, and we certainly can't afford to rest. In movement, I've learned two important things. The first is that I don't have to struggle alone. What I need, we need. You ain't free until I'm free. The second is that we need power. We, we are here because we don't have enough of it. We aren't outnumbered, we're out organized. We need organized people, a united front of freedom fighters and organized money, non-transactional. We are investing and in owning our liberation. I'm a member of Reclaim because I committed to being the change I wanna see. This change was represented most recently by our movement electing movement leaders, state rep Rick Krajewski and state Senator Nikhil Saval to office. This is monumental. We have two more freedom fighters on the inside alongside Rep Rab and Rep Fiedler. We got a squad, but our work is not done. I was elected to the steering committee by many of you. You've invested in my leadership and I wanna encourage you all to do the same for yourselves and invest in more leadership of color. Uh, you're here uh, for a reason. If your vision of change looks like mine, I invite you to invest in that vision by becoming a member of Reclaim Philadelphia. The link's gonna be in the chat. Like I said, I encourage you all to invest in your future and become a member of Reclaim. Thank you all. Wow, thanks so much, Steph. Thank you for sharing. That was, that was incredible. And thank you for investing in Reclaim's vision. Um, and thank you to all of you, everyone on this call who um, shows up for this work, uh, who shows up for your community, um, cared deeply about building a world that works for all of us. Um, I appreciate all the speakers today for taking the time to share the work that they've been doing this year with us. And again, if you'd like to join us, visit us at the link in the chat that Sergio is going to drop um, to indicate what excites you and you'll be hearing from us soon. Um, so to and things today in Reclaim, we say anything worth doing is worth evaluating. So as we close out here, I invite you to enter a feeling word into the chat box. This is just one word that describes how you're feeling right now after today's citywide meeting, um, where you're at mentally, emotionally, or physically. Um, and additionally, please share any tensions that you might have. Um, this can be about today. It can be about our work going forward. Um, intentions don't have to be negative. Um, instead, let's, let's embrace, um, you know, these feelings of unease as opportunities for attention and for growth. Um, so again, in the chat, your feeling word, um, any tensions you're feeling, um, my feeling word is connected. Um, I appreciate you all. Thank you for coming. And I hope I see you all again soon. And, and feel free to stick around um, if you'd like to go to a breakout room and debrief and socialize afterwards. Thank you again.